Today we're going to be starting our next unit, Art History. In grade 11, we explore the Renaissance. In the years prior, for example, grade 9 and 10, a lot of the focus for art history was in ancient art, prehistoric art. With the Renaissance, it's basically described in the word Renaissance itself means rebirth. This idea of wanting a change, of renewing itself, is basically what the Renaissance period uh, is all about. It's also one of the most pivotal times in terms of art and what many artists were able to achieve. Some of the most breathtaking masterpieces were created during the Renaissance period. So this is what we're going to be exploring for this unit. So just how this week is gonna work is for the next few days, I've divided this presentation um, in terms of content and it's situated for certain days of the week. Okay, so we're gonna be starting the introduction of the Renaissance today with some just basic um, sort of descriptions, understandings of some of the characteristics of Renaissance art, what makes it different, what makes it different, what makes it special, okay? Um, and then each day I will continue to add more on in terms of history, the development of different artists, different time periods, what they added to the Renaissance era. Um, and so that's basically how this week is sort of gonna flow. All right, so today in Monday's class, I'm gonna be doing the introduction of the Renaissance period and just give you some of the fundamental information. We will then have a discussion later today that counts as part of a mark, but that is all we're gonna be focusing in on today. There's no other thing <laughs> that I will assign. This is just the focus. All right, so introduction. The Italian Renaissance was a rebirth of classical values in art, literature, and philosophy. Its influence spread across Europe and gave rise to the cultural and scientific ideas that shaped artistic thought for the next 500 years. So a pretty momentous <laughs> moment and period in the realm of art. So today's focus is going to be on the rebirth, the Renaissance. How did it begin? So before the Renaissance, it's really important to have some context to understand why there was this need to renew or to have this rebirth. So let's watch this quick video about the medieval time period and the Byzantine period. We'll look at some of the artwork and why there was this need for change while a lot of artists and a lot of people were feeling that way. Oh, hi, Arturo Pittore here, but you can call me Art. This is Explorations in Art History, starring me. <laughs> you are seeing you know, people watching from around the world, you know, stuck with five-fingered prima donna. Oh, oh, well, that's better, right? See, uh, <clears throat> it looks like we'll be talking about the medieval and Byzantine periods. It had taken many lifetimes and countless battles to conquer and maintain the vast regions of the Roman Empire. When Emperor Theodosius I took power, he ruled over lands that stretched from Portugal to Palestine. The question of succession of power had always been a thorny problem in the empire. And for Theodosius, it came down to a choice between two sons. Or did it? In 395 AD, Theodosius instead split the empire in half. The western half became the domain of his son, Honorius. We call it the Western Roman Empire. The eastern half was awarded to his son, Arcadius, and became known as the Byzantine Empire. The two kingdoms both considered themselves Roman, though they spoke Latin in the west and Greek in the east. Honorius and the Western Roman Empire were besieged by barbarian hordes from the beginning. Huns, Goths, Vandals, and Franks all took turns invading Western territories. Sacking Rome became a barbarian pastime, and the Vandals, thanks to their exceptional knack for destruction and violence, gave us the word vandalism. Ow! I hate when that happened. It was a rough and tumble time. Only 81 years after the death of Theodosius, the Western Roman Empire ceased to exist. 
With the empire splintered into separate countries, the one unifying force to remain was the Catholic Church and the Pope. The Byzantine Empire, on the other hand, would last another thousand years. In 730 AD, Emperor Leo III initiated a movement called Iconoclasm. Based on a strict interpretation of the Ten Commandments, which forbade the making and worshiping of graven images and perhaps due to the rising influence of Islamic culture, the iconoclast sought the removal or destruction of paintings and sculptures. There's one. This way, man. Uh, look at it. Get it. Got it, that one. There's one. There's another one. Go and get it. Ah, we're too late. There's one. There's another one. Oh, stop him. Stop him now. Hurry. Caught him in the act. Ah, take the scoundrel away. After iconoclasm ended, Byzantine artists were limited to copying approved images from the past. I am a copy of 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 a copy. Back in Rome, Pope Gregory II rejected iconoclasm and denounced it as heretical. He even sent a letter excommunicating the iconoclasts. It's Byzantine blasphemy. Excommunicate them! As a result, artists in the West had more creative freedom. The church was the major patron of the arts, and so most medieval art had religious themes. Western artists of the later Middle Ages were interested in creating visionary experiences. Over time, in the search to create more convincing and powerful images, their art became more realistic in its portrayal of people and the natural world. I have dimension! This is Art saying thanks for sharing another fascinating exploration into... Uh, hey, I'm, I'm not done talking. What? I All right there. That was a cute little bit of context there for you in terms of history. Okay, just to help you understand why there was this movement towards the Renaissance. So uh, more of a opportunity for creative freedom for a lot of artists at that time. Oh, hi. Art two... All right, so classical values. The Italian Renaissance was a rebirth of classical values in art, literature, and philosophy. It was a period of artistic development in Western art that stretched from the revival of naturalism in the art of Giotto at the end of the 13th century to the expressive forms of mannerism in the art of Michelangelo at the start of the 16th century. Its influence spread across Europe and gave rise to the cultural and scientific ideas that shaped artistic thought for the next 500 years. During the 14th century, many Italians believed the barbarous cultures of the dark and early Middle Ages had discarded the high artistic standards set by the ancient Romans and Greeks. So guys, there's this deep desire to kind of go back to how things were especially with the Romans and Greeks and how they really tried to capture, capture the naturalist and sort of humanist aspects of say, the body, the natural world, what things look like in real life. This desire for realism to really capture the essence of real life in a piece of art. That's what they really were craving. And you can probably understand that when you look at some of the Byzantine art that I that was just seen in that little short video about the medieval era where everything was very flat and there was no sense of depth, really. Okay. So therefore, in order to restore the, these lost ideals, it was necessary for art to retrace its steps to find a new path to progress. This quest led to a revival of certain artistic principles from the classical era, which were merged with contemporary ideas to form the key elements of art during the Italian Renaissance. Among the most important of these were naturalism, all right, so a search for the perfection or form that was inspired by the naturalism of classical sculpture, for example. Humanism, the influence of the philosophy of classical humanism, which is revealed in the gradual shift from religious to secular subject matter in art. Okay, so instead of it always be the paintings or the art always centering around religion or religious figures that it can extend 
to something that is in our regular every everyday life. So paintings of say ordinary people, for example, is kind of like a secular subject. That's an example of a secular subject. So this shift away from religion and more so just to capture the things that are happening in our lives and the people in our lives. Perspective drawing is another huge component, component of the Renaissance period. The development of perspective drawing as the standard means of organizing the spatial depth of a picture. So this is where linear perspective is introduced, one point, two point perspective. This is where artists were starting to get more and more intrigued or more interested in capturing depth more accurately, okay? So new media and techniques, the development of new media and techniques were also essential. And it was also to achieve a greater naturalism in art, okay? So at the beginning periods of the Renaissance, a lot of artists were using fresco paints and then there was this gradual shift near the end of the renaissance to oil okay so main painting techniques the main painting technique in, of italian renaissance art were fresco as i mentioned all right so large scale murals and tempera for smaller panel paintings which was later superseded by the greater versatility of oil paints Oil paints, of course, are a lot more richer. They're a lot more durable in terms of lasting longer. Um, fresco paints, they work, but there's not a lot of durability as they are very much made out of sort of natural um, components, such as egg yolk and that sort of thing. All right, so the development. The development of Italian Renaissance art can be broken down into four distinct stages the Proto-Renaissance, the Early Renaissance, the High Renaissance, and the Venetian Renaissance. Okay, so here they are again. For today's class, we're gonna be focusing primarily on the Proto-Renaissance. Okay, so the Proto-Renaissance is the name given to that uncertain period of transition in Italian art as the creative influence of the Byzantine tradition began to decline. Artists saw the need for a more relevant art form that reflected the aspirations of an ambitious Italy, desperate to emerge from the stagnation of the medieval past. So the Proto-Renaissance is this sort of very crucial period, right? Anytime there's a, this, when people are in this flux of transition, right? <laughs> it's so important that, that this happen and go well, because if it doesn't, if this transi transition doesn't really go all that well, then there's no momentum. There's no momentum forward for the rest of the Renaissance to sort of continue. Um, so in this early stage, you'll see a lot of artwork slowly start to lose some of that Byzantine sort of aesthetic of everything looking very two dimensional, the proportions being off um, and that sort of thing to a more accurate or the, moving towards a more accurate depiction of humans, their bodies, how they're situated in a space primarily, um, there is a shift and you do start to notice that in the proto-Renaissance period. Okay, so during the proto-Renaissance, there was a gradual development of naturalism in Italian art, which was inspired by the values of classical humanism and the anatomical beauty of classical sculpture. You can see the start of this process when you compare two paintings by Duccio de, <laughs> I'm Italian, so I should say this long name, no problem. Buona Insegna and Giotto de Bondone. <laughs> okay, the latter one was a little easier to say. So here we have uh, two paintings, okay? So the first one here uh, that we see on our left, all right, is very much still centered in the Byzantine medieval aesthetic, right? So it's a lot flatter. Uh, the sense of depth is not there, it's not accurate. Um, it looks a little off, right? In terms of the reality of the human body and how we all appear, uh, even how things are situated, okay? Then we look at Giotto's painting and we can see that there is more of an interest in capturing reality uh, more accurately. Uh, there's a push to capturing the depth of things more accurately, shading that sort of thing. Things look less flat 
in his painting, more three-dimensional, okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit about this early, early proto-Renaissance painting here. So in Duccio's Maesta, the huge altarpiece that he painted for Siena Cathedral, the artist still has one foot stuck in the flat frontal conventions of Byzantine composition. Okay, so like I said, he's still, a, there's still a lot of <laughs> medieval reminiscence here, okay? Um, the other tries to free itself. So the, he's kind of conflicted in this painting. He's trying, he wants to try something new, but he's still very comfortable in the aesthetic that he's kind of more familiar with. So it's kind of like he is trying to change, but there's still, you know, that comfortableness of what was done in the past. And this is often the struggle that a lot of artists go through or what a lot of artists experience when they're sort of caught in between two um, periods, right? So uh, Giorgio's painting here very much shows that he's kind of stuck in two styles, right? Byzantine, very flat surface level. Um, and then Renaissance or the Renaissance ideal of trying to move to more of a naturalistic, more realistic appearance, okay? Giotto's uh, Betrayal of Christ. So in Giotto's Betrayal of Christ, a scene from his fresco cycle of life of Christ in the arena chapel in Padua, the naturalism of his figures and the la their layered composition is turned up a notch to let the, di the dramatic narrative unfold in a more naturalistic space. Okay, so of course this looks a lot more natural. The layers in terms of how people are crowded and appear on, these, on the actual composition. Okay, it's slightly more accurate in terms of it looking a little bit more believable than say this arrangement. Um, so I'm just going to continue on here. So the naturalism of his figures and their layered composition is turned up a notch and let the dramatic narrative unfold in a more naturalistic space. Very true. The figures have a greater three-dimensional form. There's more expression in their body language and eye contact, which is also a very key difference between Renaissance and all the artwork before that, especially in the medieval time, okay? with a particular focus on revealing with the revealing look between Jesus and Judas, just at the moment of his betrayal. And that's what this particular uh, painting is showing here. All right, so here are some of the artists of the Proto-Renaissance period. We have Giotto, who's very well known, Duccio, Simone Martin, Martini, sorry, uh, Ambrogio Lorenzetti, and Pietro Lorenzetti. All right, so for today, our discussion is going to take place on Jamboard during, during our synchronous session. And for this session, guys, what you're going to be doing is you're going to watch this video about a painting. Well, actually, you're going to watch it. It's about two paintings. They're, they're being compared to each other. And you're going to answer these questions one, two, and three. Okay, so number one, according to Dr. Nancy Ross, how did Christian art change from the style of classical art? What specific techniques did artists abandon and why? Two, according to the Renaissance connection, how were saints and holy figures distinguished from humans in medieval religious art? And three, how did the representation of saints change in the Renaissance? Okay, so you're going to be able to answer these questions once you watch the video. When we go into our synchronous session, I'm going to be dividing you guys into small groups. And as a group, we're going to discuss. So I will be there, of course, for each group. We're going to facilitate a discussion. And we're going to share our responses, right? We're going to share our thoughts. And it's just about listening and sharing, OK? So if you guys are coming prepared to these discussions with your own little notes, and being able to articulate yourself, whether it's in the chat or by unmuting yourself and sharing your thoughts with your own voice, that is the mark. So your participation in this activity counts for the mark. And that's how today's class 
that's how Tuesday's class and Wednesday's class will primarily work. Okay, so I will see you guys in the synchronous session. Please enjoy this video. Make some notes to answer your question and bring them along with you for the synchronous session. I'll see you soon.